right, well, it's eight o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, so thank you all for uh, coming to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. And I'm absolutely delighted this week to introduce our guest speaker for Grand Rounds, Dr. Judith Levitt. Dr. Levitt is Emeritus Professor in Medical History and the History of Science, Gender, and Women's Studies, and has had a long and storied career at the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> Story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for over 40 years. <laughs> And she's held many prior roles in the school, including notably the chair of the history of medicine department, which she held for over a decade, and the former, she was the former associate dean for faculty at the School of Medicine. Her academic interests I would describe as an intersection of public health, sociology, and politics in the United States and in Wisconsin, and has focused on um, obstetric issues such as childbirth as well as um, some interest in prior epidemics. She's been a very prolific author with numerous books and papers. Um, you can actually uh, find many of them on Amazon, as I looked. Um, <laughs> and it's really actually, it's a lot of fun looking over the topics she's written about, um, where you go, I should really read that. That sounds really cool. Uh, <laughs> just some titles from her work included Typhoid Mary, Captive to the Public's Health, Make Room for Daddy, the, jour the Journey from the Waiting Room to the Delivery Room, and actually one of my favorites, The Wasteland, Garbage and Sanitary Reform in the American City. <laughs> of note, she's also written about the history of women in medicine, particularly experiences of women at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine, and I hope someday um, to be able to talk to her more at length about that one. Um, She's gotten numerous awards and honors throughout her career, and I just um, picked out um, just a few. Uh, she's an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She received the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award at University of Wisconsin. And finally, the Lifetime Achieving, uh, Achievement Award from the American Association for the History of Medicine. And with that, I am I'm delighted to introduce her today. She's going to be talking about Public Resistance or Cooperation, Two Cities Response to Smallpox, um, and hopefully learn some lessons uh, from the past to see us through this current pandemic. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Levitt. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schnapp. Um, I'm really delighted to be here, wherever here is. <laughs> and I hope you are all healthy and doing well through this ordeal that we are all sharing. Okay, well, uh, you see my name and the title of my talk today. Um, I wish I could be looking into your faces instead of into my slides, but I'll <laughs> pretend I see people. I wanna to talk today about this disease, smallpox, which I assume most of you have not seen in person. Um, so I wanted to show you a picture. As you know, it's a systemic viral disease with a very distinctive rash. Um, and we have a lot of pictures, most of them taken from the 1920s, a few of them taken in the 1940s. Uh, the U.S. Uh, did not have any smallpox after 1950. And I want to talk about two cities and how they responded to smallpox and uh, see what we can learn from the differences. The city on your left is uh, depicted in riot formation in 1894 when smallpox uh, hit Milwaukee and had a very, very heavy epidemic. And there was a significant resistance as you can see in that picture. And on your right is uh, the city of New York. And these are people standing in line waiting for vaccination. And the year is 1947. So about 50 years, uh, give or take, um, separated these two. And I wanna explore with you why the differences and how, uh, what we can learn from them. So first I wanna talk about Milwaukee. Milwaukee, as most American cities of the 19th century, um, suffered periodic smallpox um, episodes, sometimes pretty bad epidemics. And the years are listed there, but the one I'm gonna talk about is 1894 which uh, had a major outbreak, a citywide spread. In every ward of the city, there were smallpox cases. And this map shows that the pockets are in the uh, south side, which happens to be where the isolation hospital is located. 
and another pocket on the near north side. So let's look at Milwaukee in 1894. Smallpox cases start uh, showing themselves. Fear is pretty great because people remember the other epidemics and understand that smallpox can spread pretty quickly and can be devastating, not just in how it looks, but also in um, how it behaves in the body and how you see it in other people. And death rates are fairly high in bad epidemics. Milwaukee had just appointed a new health officer. His name was Walter Kempster, and he was a physician who had been known uh, mostly for his work in psychiatry, uh, but had also done some public health work before coming to Milwaukee. He was born in Britain, spoke with a British accent, and that did differentiate him from a lot of people that he served. Uh, another thing that differentiated him was that he had instituted civil service reforms, um, which were not very popular in the city. The city jobs had been filled by patronage so that if a political party got in, they filled the jobs with people from their party. And Walter Kempster um, used merit as the reason to give people jobs. And that was extremely unpopular, especially in his own party, because they weren't getting the jobs that they were used to getting. So when smallpox came to Milwaukee, Kempster sought state advice. It, it, he was new uh, to the job and he thought maybe the state could help him. The state merely asked him what he was planning to do and he said, vaccinate and isolate. And they said, that's fine, you don't need us. And they sort of disappeared for the rest of the epidemic. Which under some circumstances, the city might've been happy to have that kind of independence from the state, but. Uh, in this case, I think they might have welcomed it. So the health department went ahead and did what it did in other smallpox epidemics in the 19th century. They launched a vaccination campaign, made vaccination free to everybody, um, and they isolated people either at home with on their door that said that smallpox within, or uh, through m removal to the recently renovated quarantine hospital. Now, the isolation hospital had been built in the 19 1870s, and it had just been renovated right before, fortuitously, I guess, right before this epidemic. They had added central heating and running water, two things that made it much more attractive than it had been before. Um, but, Hempster, and I think this was probably also uh, playing on some of the previous experiences, decided that he would remove to the quarantine hospital people from the south side, especially in crowded areas around the city, and let the middle-class native-born areas of the city um, isolate their people at home. He did forcible removal and he tried to do forcible vaccinations in the uh, immigrant wars. He did school vaccinations as shown here. Um, and you can see the kids are rolling up their sleeves, <laughs> not resisting. Um, I did want to mention that, that uh, vaccination procedure was a little different than it became in the 20th century. They did four insertions and often left bad scars, which is why a lot of people had uh, vaccinations on their legs, not on their arms, especially women, so they wouldn't show. And there were frequent cases of infected vaccine points. And so people would see arms that looked like this and not want to subject themselves to the procedure. They also quarantined people in the homes. This is um, mumps, as you see, but uh, the same would have been done with smallpox. I just like this picture a lot because it's the cover of my book about public health in Milwaukee, and it, the, the little boy looking out the door is very appealing. <laughs> and the other thing I want you to note in this picture is that uh, the health officer is wearing a police uniform, and the uniforms became an issue in controlling this epidemic. So here's a picture of the isolation hospital, newly renovated. Um, taken a few months before smallpox visited in 1894. And uh, you can see it's an imposing building and not very uh, inviting particularly. 
So there was, uh, as I was already hinting, some considerable resistance to the health department's activities. The first uh, amount of um, resistance came from the Milwaukee Anti-Vaccination Society, which uh, was present in many cities, especially American cities with uh, large immigrant populations, and especially among immigrants with the German immigrants. Um, for some reason, and it might have had to do with the, the way Germany proceeded with forcible vaccination. Uh, there was a very uh, strong feeling that uh, vaccinations were not helpful, could be harmful, and there was a strong anti-vaccination movement in the city. The isolation hospital, despite its renovations, remained contra controversial. People called it the pest house. They didn't call it the isolation hospital or the quarantine hospital. Um, and also within the medical community, there was disagreement. And that, I think, uh, was very significant. Uh, German immigrant physicians often spoke to the press about how vaccinations could be dangerous. They could cause other diseases. They could cause smallpox. Um, whereas uh, the majority of physicians were still saying they, uh, vaccination was an important preventive for this disease and giving a very clear message, the medical community as a whole gave a mixed message that way. And uh, immigrants, I think, in general, can be said to uh, uh, have feared government authority. They didn't like a uniform coming to their house and demanding things. In fact, that's the reason many of them had come to America, away from that kind of government authority. And then when uh, Kempster tried to remove children to the isolation hospital from the immigrant sections and not from the native born sections of town, uh, people immediately saw what was going on and saw, thought it was not just and thought he was being an uh, uh, um, unequal application of health policy. They also thought in the immigrant communities, and you see this in the German press, especially that people thought they were the scum of Milwaukee and they understood that they were being stigmatized that way and they didn't like it and therefore didn't want to cooperate with what the mainstream was trying to get. So their first resistance really came um, verbally, as I've just indicated in the ways, and then um, by not reporting disease when they had it in their families or in their churches and hiding cases of it from the authorities when they came knocking. This is the um, Milwaukee Anti-Vaccination Society pamphlet that came out in 1891, three years before this particular outbreak. And you can see quotations from eminent medical authorities showing the utter uselessness and injuriousness of vaccination. Uh, mothers and fathers, read and consider before you allow your children to be vaccinated. And of course, inside were all sorts of awful stories about what would happen if you submitted to this procedure. Um, Kempster understood what was going on and he issued a statement said, the laws are not enforced because the common council has prevented me. Not a single proposition that I have made has been acted upon. This has caused opposition among the people. We come to a house to remove a patient and are resisted. They tell us that their aldermen informed them that next week the laws will be changed and they need not go. This was a particular thorn in Kempster's side because the Common Council, in fact, did prevent him from um, enforcing forcible isolation and vaccination with the health department code in to be used only in the case of a raging epidemic, but it was there. And they uh, ultimately changed that ruling um, during the height of the epidemic and ruled that this was not uh, possible. But meanwhile, the health department was trying to do it. The, uh, the um, neighborhoods in which it was uh, forced upon them uh, understood the notoriety that has been recently thrust upon our section of the city. Uh, again, they believe the rest of the city view us as the scum of Milwaukee, and they very clearly said we will not submit to having our children dragged from our homes. So, in fact, there were riots in the streets. Mobs of, this is the way one newspaper reported it, mobs of Pomeranian and Polish women armed with baseball bats 
potato mashers, clubs, bed slats, salt and pepper, butcher knives, lay in wait all day for the isolation hospital van. And you see here, very domestic <laughs> weapons. Uh, and in fact, women were the most active uh, segment of the rioters. And uh, it was made it hard for police because they were reluctant to use their their clubs on um, women, especially women holding babies. Uh, and so the riots uh, continued. The um, media, the newspapers in all languages um, kept the story alive. They sold a lot of papers that way. And the riots in fact lasted about a month. Every day there were stories of people in the streets uh, assaulting health officers. Here's how it was depicted. Uh, in Leslie's Illustrated Weekly in New York City. Um, and you can see um, the woman holding the baby with the baseball bat that the police officer is trying to uh, prevent. You can see the health officer uh, putting a child into the ambulance, to go to the isolation hospital. The woman over on, the, on your far left weeping as her child is taken away, and the mobs in the streets, which of course added to the spread of the disease. So keep that picture in mind when we go on to other pictures. And it's important to say that politicians also uh, aided the disorder in the city, and in fact, might have incited some of it. Robert Rudolph was the alderman who represented the South Side, and he spoke. He came to speak on the streets of the city very often. This quotation is from the uh, newspaper. I don't blame the people down here for being worked up. The patients at the hospital are not treated like human beings and the way the dead are buried is brutal. And what he meant by that is, is you were not allowed to have public weddings, uh, sorry, public funerals. You couldn't have weddings either as it happened, but uh, he's talking about funerals. And Walter Kempster did not respond in the most sensitive ways. He said, but for politics and bad beer, the matter never would have been heard of. So he's very dismissive of the people, uh, of the immigrants especially. He said, I am here to enforce the laws and I shall enforce them if I have to break heads to do it. The question of the inhumanity of the laws, I have nothing to do with. So he's not uh, showing empathy at all to the immigrant community, which is hard hit by smallpox. Um, and in fact, he's belittling their uh, resistance and uh, not trying to understand it. So this is the social and political context in which smallpox raged in 1894. There were huge class and ethnic differences in the city and they were exacerbated uh, with this outbreak and with the way the health department was um, um, responding. There were different languages and customs and values in the city, which were uh, embedded uh, culturally through the churches, through the newspapers. Um, there were German language newspapers, Polish language newspapers, Yiddish newspapers, um, and they were uh, all saying, saying different things than what the health department was saying for the most part. The health officers themselves were, as I said, insensitive and inflexible. They just didn't want to hear anything about anything except obeying their actions. And as we said, the health department applied the policies unequally and discriminated against the immigrants. City politicians and the media used the crisis. And there was a lot of panic and most important, I think, a lack of trust. They didn't trust what Kempster was saying. They didn't trust what the mayor might be saying. Um, and they trusted only their own newspapers and their own politicians. So the epidemic raged for months. It, there were 1,074 cases in the city, 244 deaths. Um, and one of the lessons that Kempster thought he learned was that a strong health department was not enough to stem an epidemic. He had a strong health department, it was well staffed, fully funded. Um, they just hired him, which he thought of course was a plus. And uh, it, it wasn't enough to work. He and his uh, 
officers used strong arm tactics, as we said, and discriminated against those. They did not once try to forcibly remove a middle class child from their home. And that was uh, obviously seen as discrimination. So in the press and on uh, uh, in other media, in, in pamphlets and handouts that were done, there were very mixed messages and somewhat limited information. But another thing that was really important to note here is that there was no community organization from the health department. That is, they didn't go into any community um, institution like churches or school groups or uh, cultural clubs to ask them to help. And of course, once this started going, they probably would have had a pretty abrupt no from them. But in the beginning, they could have probably used that kind of help. And there was no help from the state health department or the state um, officials. So that was Milwaukee. There was, I just wanted very briefly talk about another epidemic before we get to the New York outbreak of 1947. And that's in New York City in 1900, 1901. And the reason I wanna tell you a little bit about that is because it's a sort of an in-between point here um, they weren't rioting in the streets in New York, but there was plenty of disruption. And uh, I think it's worth just taking a peek at it. The New York Health Department in 1900 also had a policy of isolation and vaccination. And they also discriminated in how they applied that policy. Uh, they did vaccination raids through poor immigrant sections of the city in which they would come into a tenement, let's say, post a health officer at the door so nobody could leave and go through every apartment in the place and try to forcibly vaccinate people. Now, obviously people hid and people got away one way or another, so they didn't, they didn't do a complete vaccination campaign, but they in fact vaccinated that way and they was seen as forcibly uh, in the poor immigrant sections of the city. And they removed people also what they thought could not be safely isolated at home and in tenement houses, they certainly thought that, um, and forcibly removed them to North Brother Island, which just by the by is where they put Mary Mallon, known as Typhoid Mary, who I've also written about. But North Brother Island is a, was a typical place that New York tried to isolate cases of infectious diseases, communicable diseases. And as one newspaper put it in 1900, she forced, this woman forced, fought like a tigress on the sidewalk and her screams aroused the neighborhood for blocks around. Her babies were at last torn from her and she was driven up the stairs to her desolate home to weep the night away as her child was taken away. The health department denied that it was discriminating in its um, enforcement, although it admitted it was doing it uh, certainly in Hell's Kitchen and other parts of Manhattan. And the city suffered 3,500 cases and 719 deaths in 1900. Um, but I just wanna point out that the policy is the same. So it's not just isolation and vaccination per se, it's how it's those two things are applied. So now I wanna to move to New York City, 1947. Uh, Smallpox came to New York uh, in the person of Eugene Labar, who was a man who lived in um, New England, actually, and had traveled to Mexico with his wife for a vacation. And on the bus, he was coming back from Mexico with his wife, and he was not feeling too well as the bus made its way across the country. By the time it got to New York City, he was really feeling lousy. So he and his wife decided they'd get off the bus and wait until he felt better before they'd go home. They checked into a Midtown New York hotel. They wandered around Fifth Avenue, stopping in various shops for a few days until he really felt he needed to see a doctor. And he went to Bellevue Hospital where he was admitted to the dermatology ward because he was showing a rash that and uh, it took a day 
maybe a day and a half before they realized that the rash was in fact likely smallpox. I didn't know for sure, but they thought it might be something contagious and they moved uh, Mr. Labar to an isolation hospital. So if you just think about that for a minute, he had a lot of opportunity within New York, let alone the bus ride from Mexico to infect other people with this disease. Um, it was finally diagnosed as smallpox and when it was, the health department announced it to the city, but not until they were, they didn't know what was going on and they didn't announce anything until he was diagnosed with smallpox. And a few days after that, he died. And the health department responded with the largest smallpox vaccination campaign in US history uh, in the shortest amount of time. And this is a child who was infected by Mr. Labar in Bellevue Hospital. He had come to the hospital for um, a tonsillectomy and he contracted smallpox. Here is a man whose name is Mr. Ocasta, who also contracted smallpox in the hospital. He came to Bellevue for a bad case of mumps and encountered uh, Eugene Labar in the process. <clears throat> now, one of the things that the health department did that was in fact different from what other and earlier health departments had done was some case tracing. So you see uh, Eugene Labar up on top, infecting three people, none of whom died. Mr. Acosta is one of them and two children. One child who lived up in uh, Millbrook, New York, uh, went home and infected three other people. That's shown on your right. And Mr. Acosta himself infected his wife, who ultimately died from smallpox, and uh, four other people. So case tracing was extremely important uh, to the health commissioner in 1947. And not only did they um, uh, do the case tracing from Bellevue and along Fifth Avenue, they never found anybody from the Fifth Avenue encounters, uh, but they also um, had help from the US Public Health Service to trace all the places that the bus had stopped on the way back from uh, Mexico. So case tracing was really important. Uh, he also, uh, the health commissioner, whose name was Israel Weinstein, uh, uh, started a mass vaccination campaign. Um, there were daily press bulletins and updates all, in all languages and all newspapers, ads and buttons that people would wear on their shirts, be safe, be sure, get vaccinated. It was all over the city very, very quickly. They geared up extremely quickly. Um, and they had a lot of help from the press and from um, the local government. Um, Weinstein understood that information and communication was key and he kept it going with his daily press bulletins and updates, uh, which he did not just in the print media, but also on the radio. And there was an immediate notion that he was to be trusted. He uh, was giving out information. It was not very favorable information. He updated it as new cases were found, um, but he was always uh, telling exactly what was happening and he was always um, urging people to get vaccinated. He wanted to, people to get vaccinated um, if they hadn't been vaccinated since childhood and if they'd never been vaccinated. Um, there were seven and a half million New Yorkers at that uh, time, 1947. And um, he estimated that about two million of them had already been vaccinated, but in fact, um, they ended up vaccinating, and I'll get to that in a minute, six and a half, almost six and a half million uh, New Yorkers. So he urged all who have not been vaccinated or have not been vaccinated since childhood to go at once to their physician to receive this protection. Um, they could go to their private physician, they could go uh, to the health department, they could go uh, all around the city. They were free, they were voluntary. Um, they were offered in 13 hospitals, 84 police precincts, every public and parochial school, elementary through high school. 
So they were widely available in, in, in areas close to everybody. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a minute about uh, how they got the vaccine that fast, but um, Mayor O'Dwyer uh, was vaccinated with great publicity. And as I said, 5 million people vaccinated in the first two weeks. That's a pretty amazing um, deployment of the vaccine. And altogether, 6,350,000 people in four weeks were vaccinated. Here's Mayor O'Dwyer getting his vaccination, looking a little worried. Uh, he gets it from the health commissioner himself. President Truman also had a very public vaccination before his visit to New York, and then he came and uh, talked publicly to the health department and to the mayor. So there was federal and local government cooperation um, around vaccination, and especially uh, uh, important, I think, is around vaccine production. Obviously, they didn't have enough vaccines sitting around to um, vaccinate six million people plus. And so they had to gear up the laboratories to produce it. Uh, immediately, uh, the city asked for federal help. They, they got state help and federal help, as it turned out, um, to get all the public laboratories producing vaccine. Um, and they had immediate cooperation with that. And then Mayor O'Dwyer invited in all the private laboratories in the city and uh, actually around the state as well uh, into the health department and, um, well, into the city hall actually. And he <clears throat> had a nice uh, room set up for them and they, he, they all came into the room and he locked the door and he told them that they will produce enough vaccine for everybody and they will sell it to the city at a fair price. No. Uh, gouging of price. And he said they weren't going to leave the room unless they agreed to do that. So the only force that was instituted during this campaign was uh, on the private laboratories to produce the vaccine. The other thing that uh, Israel Weinstein did, and, and O'Dwyer helped him with this too, was to mobilize um, community organizations and to hire or ask for volunteer workers to help with the campaign. So they uh, included the, the Red Cross, the Civilian Defense Volunteer Organizations, various teachers groups and, and women's clubs, which was very active in this period. So the Civil Defense Volunteer Organization, I should point out, this is immediate post-war, People had been mobilized during the Second World War and understood how to help and had uh, experience with volunteering in community organizations. And so they got a lot of people, I think, because of the timing of this particular epidemic also uh, to help out. So there were volunteer workers all over the city helping um, inform people and get them out to the places where the vaccine was given. Public compliance, as you can imagine, six six million plus people getting vaccinated in a city which had seven and a half million people. It's a huge compliance uh, success. And this is the picture. I have a bunch of pictures, but this is my favorite. Um, it's in the Bronx. It's uh, which is where I used to live. Um, it's in front of Morrisania Hospital. And you can see the people lined up in a fairly orderly fashion. Um, and they stood there for hours. Because the line obviously was a slow moving line, even though it was a pretty efficient campaign that still couldn't happen automatically. And they stood there and if they needed to, they came back the next day and stood again, waiting for their vaccination. So this is, uh, you know, I think <laughs> the ultimate in uh, public cooperation. There's another line which doesn't look quite as orderly in Brooklyn, outside the health department, uh, where people also were waiting uh, for their vaccinations. And here it is inside the health department where people are rolling up their sleeves, uh, 
looks on their face, eager to participate. So a very different kind of public response, really matching a very different kind of health department response uh, to the epidemic. You can see this one, by the way, the uh, caption is still on it, that vaccinations, these vaccinations were given after nine cases were reported. There were ultimately 12 cases, but that's so what I was saying. Dr. Weinstein was really very good about keeping the public up to date on what was happening and what increases there might be, and really how few increases there were. They had predicted over 4,000 cases based on their previous experience with smallpox and 902 deaths, and they only had 12 cases and two deaths uh, in the end. So it's important to see that this convincing result was really the result of government agencies at all levels working together with private and community groups, the public information blitz. It was uh, the policy was applied uh, non discriminatorily and the networks of citizen activity were really crucial. To the success of this. Uh, um, response to the outbreak. And Weinstein thanked everybody. He said he had a debt to the press and the radio, his staff, city nurses, city employees, the mayor, and the intelligent cooperation of the public and the generosity of private physicians and volunteer workers, without whom it would have been impossible to have achieved this remarkable record. And he was absolutely right. He needed all of that. He understood that he needed all of that and he uh, employed it to uh, the benefit of everybody. So now let's just do a quick comparison of the two city experiences. Both cities, I think it's important to say, had strong health departments at the time of the outbreak, or the potential outbreak. Um, they were fully funded, fully staffed, and had the support of the local and state government. In the Milwaukee example, the state of Wisconsin withdrew from helping. Uh, and I have to say, even after they saw the riots taking place, they didn't offer to uh, come in and help in any way. Whereas New York City had state and federal cooperation uh, really helping uh, not just with the case tracing, but with the vaccine production. In Milwaukee, they used strong arm tactics. In New York City, they didn't. It was information and respect for the people. Um, Milwaukee, we saw that it was discriminatory and in New York City, even handed. Milwaukee, there was information, but it was limited and the press was very, very partisan. Uh, whereas in New York City, there was multilingual media blitz and it was all saying the same message. Not that it wasn't doing investigative reporting, but that it was uh, uh, giving a clear message. In Milwaukee, a very mixed messages. Um, in Milwaukee, also no citizen activity, whereas we saw citizen groups very active in New York City and it produced riots in Milwaukee and order, civic order uh, in New York City. And of course, in Milwaukee, they had a raging epidemic and in New York, they had a confined outbreak. Okay, I'm gonna um, try to haste up. We have time for some questions. So the implications for today, um, first of all, we see historically that the that response of the public to infectious diseases has covered the spectrum from violent resistance to cooperation. You can find examples of a lot of in between those two extremes. The historical experiences demonstrate the need for strong and well supported integrated public health infrastructure and that uh, is something that we have let go a little bit, I think, in the country today. Um, on the whole, I would say that coercion has not been as effective as public education and citizen involvement. Although there are cases, I think, when um, the disease is very quickly transmitted, um, some coercion may be necessary, but if it's done in conjunction with public education and citizen involvement, it doesn't have the same feeling. I think one of the messages from the smallpox examples particularly is the vaccine itself will not solve the problem. I think we're getting, you know, kind of hopeful that if we had a vaccine for COVID-19, we would in fact solve the problem. Uh, obviously it's a very important step, but it's not the only step. 
public support is based on frequent and honest information and communication, um, which is easier said than done. But we saw when it works, it works for those reasons. Um, the media plays a very important role. I, I think it can be investigative and interpretive, but it cannot be partisan. Which again, I think we're seeing today. Um, the health department can be most successful when it respects the public's need to know. That is, keep the public informed about what is actually happening um, and what the government is doing to try to alleviate the issue. The importance of perception, but more the importance of reality of justice and equity uh, have been extremely important historically. And uh, I think tell us something about what we need today. So the lessons we learned, I think uh, I've also written a similar thing having to do with bioterrorism. They're the same uh, in some ways. Um, much may be unknown as the response develops, but uh, you need to keep people informed about what you do know. Sometimes very quick actions are needed. Strong infrastructure again is essential and should be in place before the crisis. Community networking and cooperation must be developed and nurtured alongside strong education component. Um, in the 20th century, public health departments have really learned the importance of public education uh, in public health matters. And um, it really followed, I think, really from early in the 20th century, it followed because of the germ theory. And um, Instead of focusing just on the environment, which is the way 19th century uh, health departments had a big focus on sanitary environments, uh, health department moved in the 20th century toward much more individual attack on the disease, which made imperative a strong education component to their work. And again, fairness and non-discrimination essential to compliance. Now, I just want to say one more thing about fairness, and this is my last slide. Um, it's not just about consistent application of the laws, although it's, it is about that, and that's a very important part of uh, what needs to happen and what needs to be perceived. Um, but it has to understand, that is, health departments and all of us have to understand that we're dealing with two very important and equally valued priorities here, civil liberty and public health protection. Now, uh, as Dr. Schnapp told you, I've worked a lot on uh, Mary Mallon, Typhoid Mary, and civil liberty obviously was a big part of the controversy about her because she was kept in isolation uh, on North Brother Island uh, for most of her adult life um, and until she died. And so her her uh, liberty and her personal freedom was taken away um, in the name of protecting the public health. And it's really, it's, it's really when the two come into conflict that health departments have to be most careful and most sensitive to what they are doing and who they're doing it to. Because historically it is people like immigrants, African-Americans um, who have been most negatively affected um, in the name of public health, because it's their civil liberty that's that's uh, taken away, most importantly. So I want to say just that effective epidemic control, justly and equally administered, with the smallest restriction on individual freedom compatible with public health, can give government what it doesn't have now, a good name. And I think we all need that. Thank you very much. I'm going to show you just some things I've written about specifically what I talked about today. Uh, my book on Milwaukee and the politics of health reform, an article I wrote about the New York City uh, 1947 epidemic, um, my book on Typhoid Mary, and two op-eds my husband and I wrote together, one after SARS, Fear and Its Uses, which uh, appeared in 2003, and one that we've just written, Don't Let COVID-19 Unleash Bias, which came out in the Progressive um, a couple weeks ago. 
So thank you very much. I really look uh, forward to hearing some voices other than my own. <laughs> and I would love to uh, respond to any questions you have. Great. Well, thank you so much. It was um, a little bit scary uh, <laughs> hearing about the history and realizing how much is still so relevant for what we're dealing with today. Um, you know, thinking about the anti-vaccine vaccine groups. Uh, um, yeah, um, <laughs> fascinating. I agree. I do want to say, though, in response to that one thing, and that is that we can't make a direct analogy, I think, between the past and the present because context matters. And we are in a different place, obviously, than we were in the end of the 19th century. But as, a, as my uh, talk indicated, I do think there are a lot of lessons to be learned now. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, um, well I'll re I will read you some of the questions that have come up. Okay. okay. Um, human mobility has vastly increased in the time uh, since the time of smallpox and influenza pandemics, um, increasing exponentially the spread of infectious diseases. How do you think this impacts our ability in the U.S. to fight pandemics, um, given that we do not have a national? I'm not sure what the what, but. Yeah, so pandemics in the, the era of travel. Well, obviously things are much faster now than they used to be. Um, I, I'll just give one other historical example before I explicitly answer that. And that is when cholera uh, hit in 19th century, in the, in the world in the 19th century, the US watched it move from Asia where it started across uh, Western Europe. And every uh, month there would be it's coming closer, it's coming closer, it's coming closer. And finally, it did, in fact, cross the Atlantic and get to the United States. So, so disease has traveled before, but it traveled, obviously, much more slowly. And I do think that the fact that we can move so quickly um, does alter how um, health departments can um, be effective. And they, it might mean that they have to be much quicker at planning and much quicker to actually execute um, isolation, possibly, um, first, uh, in an effort not to let it spread. If, they, if we had done case tracing and isolation and case tracing with the very first cases that came to this country, I think we would have been much more effective. Yeah. Um, next question from Dr. Lucy. We see in the current pandemic, as well as in past pandemics, a desire on the part of politicians and commentators to find, to blame someone or somewhere. Um, what are the parallels in history? And does how does this wish to blame someone other than ourselves serve the public good? I think it's a little bit of a rhetorical <laughs> question at the end. <laughs> right. Uh, hi, Dr. Lucy, good to <laughs> talk to you here. Um, well, of course, it doesn't serve uh, really the public good at all to blame, but that is an inclination that a lot of people have. Uh, they don't want to be put on the spot themselves and they think they can point a finger and everything will go away more easily uh, because it's the other people who are to blame. And of course, uh, there are many, many historical examples. Um, uh, Typhoid Mary is certainly one who was, I think, quarantined uh, as much as she was despite other healthy carriers being around at the same time, because she was Irish and because she was a single woman, uh, as it happened also lived, cohabiting with a man at the time, uh, which made it okay to stigmatize her and to send her off and think of her as expendable. Um, and, you know, going way back to a uh, plague epidemic in San Francisco at the beginning of the 20th century, Chinatown, the first case was in Chinatown. And so the whole of Chinatown um, had a, was cordoned off from the rest of the city, even though cases of plague appeared outside of Chinatown among non-Chinese people. But the Chinese were blamed for it. And uh, it was easy again to do that uh, and to other them and uh, make, make them sound responsible. So, you know, I think, uh, it may be a natural tendency, but I think we really have to fight it because I think uh, it's it's um, it hasn't been effective historically, and it's unlikely to be effective now or in the future. Um, next question: 
How do you think the anti-vaccination movement, the current one, and social media has changed or not changed public belief in our public health and professionals, medical professionals? Well, as, as I had said, there was an anti active anti-vaccination um, movement earlier, so that's not that different. I think social media has made things very different in that we have instant um, information and inf instant misinformation um, circulated and, and uh, the public has very little way to weigh one against the other, the informa good information versus misinformation. And so I think with it out there and the way that we have become silos in our political communication through social media, um, that that is uh, uh, exacerbating the problem um, majorly. And I think it, it does behoove health departments, local governments, and federal government to um, try to combat that um, with a, a clearer message. Uh, you know, it's always going to, uh, social media has really changed how people get their information. And somehow we have to break that chain and, um, yeah, I think if we're aware of it, we're more likely to be able to break it. Um, so in the past epi epidemics, were businesses shuttered? Um, and what was the, how did any of the economic implications affect public behavior and public perception? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. Um, businesses tended in the past, especially in the 19th century epidemics, it tended to be divided. There were some businesses, and usually the bigger businesses that could weather the storm a little more easily, would cooperate with health department activity. Um, sometimes it meant shutting down, sometimes it meant um, uh, reducing sales or reducing. Movie theaters, for example, were not shut down, for example, in Milwaukee during the influenza epidemic of 1918. Movie theaters were shut down briefly but they were open if they could have every other row and every other seat taken, to, keeping some social distance. I'm not sure it was enough, but uh, that's, that's the way they handled it. So the bigger businesses were able to weather the storm more easily. The smaller ones, uh, many of them in fact folded and were very, very against um, health department uh, sanctions. So there, there has been a, a, an economic price to pay for health department's success. And then you could even argue that the more successful the health department is in its uh, seeking um, what we now call social distancing, um, the worse it is for some businesses. Um, I'll give you one other example from Milwaukee. The, um, when certain diseases were found to be transmitted in milk, for example, the health department tried to put very strict um, sanctions on milk producers from the farm to the city, and the small milk producers couldn't afford it. And the big milk producers were very strong supporters of the health department, not just because they might have been anyway, but because they could really benefit economically from it. They could weather the storm and they could get through it and at the same time lose some of their competition. So they saw it that way and they acted that way. Business is, has been an important factor, um, sometimes positive for the health department's point of view, sometimes negative, but always to um, economic um, consequences. So there's a couple of questions. I'll try to combine them. Basically asking you to rate um, our response and the uh, various world responses uh, to COVID, um, yeah. <laughs> what has worked well, perhaps what has not, what advice would you uh, perhaps um, give our current government? And um, I'll just stop there. Well, uh, yeah. you know, historians are notoriously bad at talking about the present, <laughs> and especially the future. So I don't know if I will even venture there. I, th I think the lessons that I talked about, many of them are in fact relevant in, in um, rating how we're doing today and how various countries are doing. 
Obviously, if you have a really robust response, um, one that is well-funded, well-coordinated from different levels of government and with community organizations, you're going to have much more success at doing it. And we, I think it's pretty clear to all of us, have not been great at any level of doing that. And I think the states have responded um, more wisely than the federal government has in this case. Um, but even for the states, it's been very hard. <laughs> um, any final words of wisdom for us in, in the medical professions as we're trying to um, manage public opinion uh, about this, uh, our current COVID epidemic, um, as well as managing the balancing act with um, economic recovery? Well, I think balancing act is the right way to put it. And I thank all of you for the work that you're either doing directly or indirectly. I'm sure you've trained a lot of the people who are doing it directly, if you're not doing it directly yourself right now. Um, I think it's just been an enormously hard uh, couple months that we've been through and it's going to continue that way, it looks. Um, and I guess I just uh, would say that, it, that a lot of our focus does seem to be on on uh, the medical. Obviously, what's happening in our hospitals is horrible and needs a lot of support. Um, but I also want to say that even even after we get a medication that can treat this disease, even after we get a vaccine that can prevent this disease. Those are not going to be the final word. Uh, we really do have to pay attention to how they are applied and used and to continue to support uh, public and private efforts um, uh, to gain public trust and public cooperation. And that is a job for everybody. And it's going to it's going to take time, given that we don't have a lot of trust right now. Um, and I am hopeful that we can pay as a uh, uh, pay attention to that part of the story as well. Very important part of what is happening and what will happen. Great. Well, with that, um, we'll um, hold this to a close. Um, I look forward, perhaps, to a some future articles uh, <laughs> reflecting on COVID from Dr. Levitt, perhaps. Um, <laughs> And uh, I want to thank everyone for participating, and I particularly want to thank Dr. Levitt for agreeing um, to present to us and um, uh, learning how to use WebEx. <laughs> yes, with Clint's help. <laughs> so thank you, Clint, for um, <laughs> tutorials. Uh, and um, I encourage you to go go to Amazon and uh, look at some of her books. They're really fascinating. I mean, there's it's really interesting to go back to history and seeing how many similarities there are uh, and um, what has worked and what, is, what has not to give us insights into moving forward. So thank you again. Uh, and we'll thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and I've enjoyed virtually talking with you. <laughs> Take care everybody, thank you.